today's session the top uh the topic is crime against humanity and genocide what can be done to stop the perpetrators which is very relevant to the current world situation uh, even though all of you are familiar with dr kausar's background as uh, we had a session uh, the last week, but still I want to take the honor of introducing him once again, because I have a very vibrant career as we have just heard. Dr. Kausar is currently working as an adjunct professor at the University of Winnipeg Political Science Department. He has co-founded a Winnipeg-based nonprofit organization named the Conflict and Resilience Research Institute Canada, which is an affiliated research organization at the University of Winnipeg. His research interest areas are Rohingya crisis, genocide prevention, refugee education, counterterrorism through education, and many more. Sar has received his PhD in peace and conflict studies from the University of Manitoba, Canada, back in 2017. He has also served in Bangladesh Army and voluntarily retired at 2010 as a left-hand corner. Sir, I want to invite you uh, to start today's session and uh, I hope it will be a wonderful one. Thank you, sir. Onak dhunubad. Mamtaj Manwar, Professor Mamtaj Manwar, Aashanko dhunubad. Ebang Major Faisal Achin BUP theke apna ke Aashanko dhunubad. Ama ke issue jokto ko kore dey ajonno. Ami godo duoto sessionu ekhi kotha bolici. It's a pride and it's a privilege uh, to speak to apna uh, their shomosto young manusha, young minds, uh, which is really important. আর আমি আজকে লেকচারটা সাজিয়েছি যেটা আমি একটু পরে শুরু করব এটা আমার খুব পছন্দের একটা সেক্টর আমি এটা নিয়ে খুব ডিপলি ইনভলভড গত 5 বছর থেকে এবং আপনারা আমার বায়ো জানেন অনেকেই বাই দিস টাইম সো উইনিপেগে আমাদের একটা খুব বড় একটা প্ল্যাটফর্ম আছে মিউজিয়াম ফর হিউম্যান রাইটস সো ওখানে এটা নিয়ে আমরা অনেক কাজ করি যেগুলো আমরা আজকে শেয়ার করব so, I will give a lecture to English because I will comfort feel And in Bangla English, do will switch to English. I will give the lecture to you. And I will give lecture to you PDF to Professor Mamtaj. I will request you to share it with you. And I will give you a resource আর জেনোসাইড বিষয়টা একটা খুব একটা আমি বলবো ইস এ লাইফ চেঞ্জিং লাইফ অল্টারিং একটা সিচুয়েশন ফর থাউজেন্ডস এন্ড থাউজেন্ডস এন্ড মিলিয়ন্স অফ পিপল সো এই জন্য আমি আপনাদের সবাইকে রিকোয়েস্ট করব সোর্স গুলো আপনারা দেখবেন এবং देयर ইজ এ কল একটা ইনেট কল আছে এই এই বিষয়টায় যেখানে মানুষের জন্য মানুষ কিছু করবে এই ধরনের একটা থিমেটিক ইয়ার উপর আমি আজকে লেকচারটা সাজিয়েছি so without further ado, uh, let me uh, get into our business and I will share my screen as desired. Amar screen to the head, Yes, sir. Yes. So folks, uh, once again, uh, 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 thank you so much, uh, Bangladesh University of Professionals for inviting me to have this lecture and this, I would say quite an honorous task because it is uh, not very easy to do something virtually and i always hated to uh, you know uh, do lecture on uh, on a virtual platform and neither my students do like uh, that i should talk on uh, you know uh, from a virtual platform so nonetheless um, the uh, the plus side is uh, i can speak to you at least i can share my ideas and a uh, lot of information virtually you know it's, it's a continent distance uh, that we both are you know, kind of living at this point in time. So I titled my talk today is Crimes Against Humanity and Genocide and what we can actually do to stop the perpetrators because as the lecture unfolds, you will realize that uh, this often quoted term, never again, has never been implemented or never it stayed. It happened again and again. There are cases and out of out of these, uh, you know, past couple of decades, I've chosen five uh, cases to talk about. So you will see that this never again phrase never got really into into reality. So this is why this lecture is so important. And as I said uh, in in the uh, informal beginning of the lecture, that this is very close to my heart uh, as I started 
uh, involving myself in Rohingya genocide studies uh, since 2017 through my not-for-profit organization, Conflict and Resilience Research Institute Canada. And since then, I devote a lot of time in understanding uh, the phenomena itself. And uh, that reminds me to, to share with you uh, uh, maybe a, a, a kind of uh, thought that in, in, in animal kingdom, if you consider all the animals other than humans, you'll never find that a bunch of tigers or lions or horses rose against their own fellow horses, lions and tigers and killed them or ate them. Animals never do that. Animals are not, you know, war criminals. Animals cannot think uh, in terms of, you know, a large scale, you know, extermination of their fellow animals. They don't. It is quite interesting that only humans, we, who can think and who can act, we are capable of such kind of brutality. You know, in, in, in whole human history, our history is, is, of course, we have achieved so much, so many things over these millennia, you know, 100,000 years even, if we go back and follow Noah Hariri's famous, you know, three-stage revolutions. But at the same time, we also inherited this innate capability of killing our own, you know, folks, our own kinsmen. That is the whole essence I would request you to deeply think why, why do we do that? So with this brief intro, let's proceed. The scope of our lecture, as you see on the screen, we'll talk about definitions, preventions, couple of case studies, and finally, and uh, as I always do, uh, uh, so I'll talk about Bongabuntu Center for Bangladesh Studies in Canada and Conflict and Resilience Research Institute's work in the areas of genocide awareness, especially with regards to Bangladesh genocide. Folks, I would like to start also today with this couple of poignant, you know, memoirs of genocide and genocide's trial. As you see on the screen, these famous photos, and uh, I'm sure, uh, well, uh, it is there in the slide, so I'm not going to ask you wh where, where these photos are taken. So you know famous Nuremberg trial, and which happened right after the aftermath of the Second World War to try the perpetrators of Holocaust and, uh, and, and rest of the war crimes. And one of the judges wrote that, which I have uh, uh, quoted here, new evils requires new remedies, new sanctions to defend and vindicate the eternal principles of right and wrong. And, and see, in, in this gallery where all those German officers are sitting reluctantly, as if nothing happened with them, as if they were not very sure what they were doing over these past couple of years to millions of Jews, Romas, and other people. And this is extraordinary. And this is what is my main focus in today's lecture, that we, we are extraordinarily capable of remain very calm and orchestrate enormous hostility and brutality against our own fellow human beings. And the next slide is uh, the most famous course and the trials that happened in Jerusalem with regards to Mr. Eichmann, who was captured in Argentina. There's a beautiful Netflix film. Uh, if you would like to watch it, uh, uh, I would highly recommend. And here I'm quoting Hannah Arendt because I, we often quote her. She is one of the philosophers, and she was actually attending the trial of Eichmann in uh, Jerusalem. <laughs> and this is what is really striking in the in this whole trial, as she uh, described in her book, 
uh, banality of evil. And you see the banality, the word itself, normal, as if nothing happened, as if it's, it's a day-to-day -day event. Somebody went out in the office and in between while coming back from office killed 100,000 people, something like that. And I, I, I read it because it might touch your heart. And I quote here from, uh, from Hannah Arendt, the trouble with Eichmann was precisely that so many were like him and that the many were neither perverted nor sadistic, that they were and still are terribly and terrifyingly normal. From the viewpoint of our legal institutions and of our moral standard of judgment, this normality was much more terrifying than all the atrocities put together." Unquote. Folks, this is what is important today. I'll go with the definitions and et cetera because we are in academic platform, but at the end of the class, I'm going to ask you this very question. Why it is so normal, the, the crimes of the crime, I mean, this is the utmost crime that somebody can do, kill a whole group of identifiable group of people and then as if nothing happened. The second quote here, what has come to light is neither nihilism or cynicism as one might have expected, right? I mean, we, we think of murder as nihilist, you know, and frustrated, grieve, and I had a lot of, have, you know, grievance in about life, etc. But look, in the whole trial, Hannah Arendt was there and she, she kind of observed that it is neither nihilism or cynicism, but a quite extraordinary confusion over elementary question of morality, the fundamental question of morality, right and wrong, as if an instinct in such matters were truly the last thing to be taken for granted in our time." Unquote. So uh, <laughs> Eichmann's photo is in this slide too. Look at his face. I, I have served quite a bit of photos to put up in this slide. So this one I thought most pertinent looks how, uh, you know, look at the photo. It seems he's just doing his duty. And he actually wrote uh, somewhere, and uh, this is in the internet, you know, you can also see that one. And he, he said that, I realized that life is predicated on being obedient is a very comfortable life indeed. And this is what he maintained throughout the trial that he was only discharging the orders of Mr. Hitler. So with this uh, brief introduction, let me orient you rather. I, I know most of you are aware, and in today's world, uh, this uh, open source knowledge is everywhere. So you don't really <laughs> need to memorize anything per se, but just so that you know that I have, uh, I'm quoting uh, these definitions from uh, UN United Nations Office on Genocide Prevention and Responsibility to Protect, because the last part is important as we speak uh, and delve further. So there are two, three things together we use in order to define this highest crime of, you know, in our, in our, in our vocabulary. So let me start with crimes against humanity. And as you see, it, it has not been codified so far uh, as uh, the Office of the Genocide Prevention observes. But the prohibition of crimes against humanity and other uh, prohibition of genocide has been uh, considered as a part of international law. And accordingly, uh, if you remember 1998 Rome Statute, which established International Criminal Court is the document which reflects the consensus among number of international community on the matter that crimes against humanity needs to be taken care of and stopped. And uh, you will have these things. So in general, we don't have a definition as we have for genocide because genocide itself uh, has a convention, uh, which I'll show a little later, but crimes against its humanity is also a part of uh, you know, uh, actions by perpetrators that also are mentioned in International Criminal Court and particularly geared towards uh, dealing with these things. So what we have in terms of Article 7 in the International Criminal Court Crimes Against Humanity, 
uh, I tried to highlight uh, two things here, just two things. Uh, so crimes against humanity uh, for the purpose of the statute, especially the Rome statute, which has been shown here, uh, just uh, mark the uh, item in uh, section D or the part D, which is talking about deportation or forcible transfer of population. Uh, the reason I highlighted is because it is connected with our discussion of Rohingya genocide today. And there is a whole uh, bunch of, let's say, 11 uh, items mentioned uh, in Article 7, which constitutes crimes against humanity. And on the right side of the slide, what you see is elements of the crime. So in the elements of the crime, again, you will see the uh, number four, the deportation or forcible transfer of population is included. So in both cases, what I'm trying to argue that the, uh, the Rome Statute Article 7 is very clear about the number of actions which will be considered if one perpetrator uh, you know, uh, or several perpetrators do that, and out of which the, the, this particular deportation and forcible transfer is, is, is very common. And we have we will see over this you know, uh, next couple of slides that this is what is actually the, I would say, the very common norm that the perpetrators adopt. So they forcibly transfer you know, uh, victims from one place to other. So in general, what Rome statute says is that the attack directed against any civilian population, remember, there, is, there are international humanitarian law, Geneva conventions. Again, I'm not going there in, in details because that is not the purview of our today's class. But remember, when war starts, during the war, the warring parties are expected to follow certain norms. And these norms are codified in Geneva Convention and others. But essentially, every time in war, you really cannot target civilians. You just cannot. If you target, if damages or you know, hostilities are done against civilians, then you will be held liable under this uh, you know, crimes against humanity clause. So civilian populations means a course of conduct involving the multiple commission of acts referred to you know, as I uh, shown you and pursuit of or uh, to or in furtherance of a state or organized policy to commit such attack. The clause is very clear that if organized attack as a part of policy happens, then it qualifies to be treated as crimes against humanity. So how it happens, it, it goes into you know, more details. So I here would like to share with you that there are two things always happens in the minds of perpetrator. One is with the knowledge of attack. So as you see, the contextual element of this knowledge determines that crimes against humanity involves either large scale violence in relation to the number of victims or its extension over a broad geographic area. And nonetheless, it is important to understand the methodic, methodical type of violence used, which is systematic. Not a sudden you know, uh, killing of five people in a, in a remote place that won't qualify as, as uh, crimes against humanity. The methodology is important. The intention of it is important. As I say, the knowledge of attack is important. But when we talk about genocide, we'll find out there is a subtle difference here. And this one is about genocide and crimes against humanity, where it Genocide is particularly defined an attack against a targeted or specific group. Instead, the victim of the attack can be any civilian population regardless of its affiliation and identity. So crimes against humanity with all these acts, the knowledge of the attack, which we call mental part of the element is important, large size, but it might not be targeting a specific ethno, cultural, political, religious group, might not because that is what genocide deals with. So you should be very clear when you use the term because you cannot use the term interchangeably. 
So after today's class, and I'm sure Professor Mumtaz will take further classes on that. So you should be very clear, knowledgeable that these terms should not be used interchangeably. Next slide, <clears throat> war crime. So what is war crime? So war crimes is again, a little different because as the title says, which is happening during a war. So according to UN's office, same office, it's, it's about grave breaches of the Geneva Convention, uh, which has been signed in 1949. And it uh, it involves you know all these eight types of actions like willful killing, torture, willful causing great sufferings, extensive destruction, compelling prisoner of war of the protected person. I mean, which is called enslaved uh, labor. Then willful deprivation of the prisoner of war, unlawful deportation, and taking of hostage. And here I would like to pose a question: Do you folks think? that American intervention, let's say Western intervention in general, in Iraq, especially in the case of Abu Ghraib prison, do you think Western powers committed war crime? Keep the question in your mind. I will re re I mean, revisit the question at the end. I request Professor Mamtas to kindly uh, remind me if she, uh, if she kindly do does that so that we, we, we can revisit because just see the list. Yes, sir. Just see the list here that if these are constitutes, uh, these constitute war crime, whether Western powers during their intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and with particular reference to Abu Ghraib prisons, uh, prison, uh, whether uh, they can be held responsible for war crime. Protocols. Um, so you should be aware of Geneva Protocols, uh, Convention of 1864, first one and uh, uh, even before the First World War, right? So uh, that is the uh, very heyday of you know, global conflict. And uh, subsequently it was refined after Second World War 1949. And uh, there are two, two categories of international law that deals with war crimes and crimes against humanity. And it has 1949 and also a additional protocol of 1977. And uh, both Hague uh, law and Geneva law identifies several of the violations uh, and its norms, uh, but not all as war crime. So there are differences in war crime and crimes against humanity. Uh, there is no single document in international law that codifies all war crimes. Remember, it is very contextual and that is why you go to court. Right. I mean, it, if it would have been very codified, then you could have just gone and you know, you know, do your own stuffs, try, but you can't because it is contextual and it must be established whether the you know war crime or crimes against humanity uh, has happened. So, uh, but the list of the war crimes can be found uh, in many of the countries. I mean, as as you see, the last point that both international humanitarian law and international crimes law treaties. So in many of the countries in the world, uh, we do have those conventions written in our constitutions even. In, in many of the Western countries, you will find it, it is enshrined in the constitution uh, so that the, the state or the country cannot get involved in, the, in those kind of acts. Folks, let me reintroduce Rafael Lemkin, the founder of the idea of the concept of genocide a Polish Jew lawyer by trade. And uh, here you see his identity card because he was, everyone, I mean, was persecuted in the then German occupied territories. But what is important is the spirit, the tenacity, the importance of this gentleman's contribution to tell us, all of us, that genocide is this. If you do these things, it is genocide, the topmost crime in our vocabulary. And he first actually started writing it uh, in 1944. And uh, this is the uh, book uh, cover that I thought that you should know, Axis Rules in Occupied Europe. And I think um, if we read more closely, and I'm sure Professor Mumtaz will, uh, uh, has already included this one as a uh, as a compulsory read, uh, because uh, this is the starting point. You must read his original text to understand 
the context. Folks, context is important in genocide. And Rafael Lemkin's initial thought, as we know now, actually uh, started uh, because he watched very closely Armenian genocide, which Turkey, I mean, uh, modern day Turkey, but uh, at that time, Ottoman Turkey perpetrated between 1880s, uh, 90s, up to 1906, prior to World War One. So that really bothered him. And uh, since then, he was thinking uh, to do something with regards to genocide. And here it comes 1944 and then 1948. So do have a read us at least this book because this gives you this whole idea how he came about uh, genocide and all these things. And um, I think uh, I would only uh, show one video clip which is less than uh, two minutes. So bear with me because it is important to see himself talking, right? I mean, it's a historical, uh, and this is available in the YouTube, you know, you don't have to, uh, search now, I'll give you the link. So let's have a, uh, uh, just give me one sec here. For the university and special. Let me switch the screen. Can you see now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fantastic. So, where is my mouse? Okay, good. Uh, just have a listen. Combining the Greek word genos, genos meaning race or group, with the root of the Latin sidere meaning to kill. Dr. Raphael Lemkin, who is a professor of law at Yale University and specializing in teaching uh, matters about the United Nations, Dr. Lemkin is the man who created the word genocide. Dr. Lemkin, could you give us a little background on how you came to be interested in this genocide? I became interested in genocide because it happened so many times. It happened to the Armenians, and uh, after the Armenians, the production. Lemkin became the leading force behind the drafting and adoption of the International Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, adopted unanimously by the United Nations General Assembly in Paris on December 9, 1948. I would edit, and I think that's the spirit, the unanimous view of the Assembly, that this convention be signed by all states, ratified by all parliaments at the earliest date, in order that basic human rights be given the protection of international law for the sake of progress, social, and international peace. So, um, so this is what we are talking about. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, for the sorry for the ad. So this is uh, this was Rafael Lemkin himself talking about uh, genocide and why it is important. And I think the uh, next link I thought that you should be also uh, watching at, at your own time uh, is about Samantha Power. And we have read her works in our PhD program, a phenomenal speaker, and who was uh, during the Obama administration, uh, UN, uh, American uh, representative in the UN. So she, she wrote a phenomenal book actually. Uh, so have, have a very brief listen. I will not play the whole clip. Now, the problem with generalized commitments to human rights, and genocide is a great example, is like, wow, it's a crime against humanity. It really is. It's just so big and so big and so hard. And yet, the very generality. Sir, sir can I, sorry, sir. Can, sir, can you just uh, play the subtitles, sir? Just start sorry. on the subtitles, sir. This one? Subtitle to sir, Thakle, YouTube, sir. Oh, I see. How do you do that? So YouTube is a CC Namak option as a sir. Uh, just let it. Oh. Oh, this one? Screen is a CC uh, the act option as a sir. Right, right. 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 So, right. so, yeah, I'm, I'm clicking it, but it is not going anywhere. <laughs> sir, video play, sir. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sir. 
So I leave it uh, there um, because we, we, uh, our intention is not to uh, listen to this, uh, to the uh, what you call works of Samantha Power. And she wrote a, a brilliant book. And I think I have given you uh, uh, some references, uh, uh, reading materials, uh, because it is uh, titled uh, Problem from Hell. And she was talking about Bosnian war and Bosnian war crime. So uh, feel free to uh, listen. And I'm sorry, I couldn't put these captions on. I don't know how it worked. Sir, sir, it was a sino na sir. Yate option. Majhe majhe sir option to thake na. Oh, I see. Right system hi chilo na sir. Apna. I'm sorry, <laughs> folks. Didn't realize that. So, um, but it is. Uh, I mean, it's just a YouTube link, and you know, I'll have a look when you have time. So moving on the history of genocide, because we are talking about genocide now. We have dealt with crimes against humanity and war crimes. We have gone through the definitions and uh, the way UN office uh, recognizes it. <clears throat> so we, we are on that. But now let's talk about uh, the particular, you know, uh, or, or the main theme of our today's discussion. So genocide was first recognized uh, as a crime under international law in 1946, just as a reference. And it was codified as an independent crime in 48 Convention on the Prevention. That is the exact title, uh, because you folks should uh, should remember the exact title of this one, uh, because word matters, right? I mean, in the uh, areas of <laughs> trials and other things. So 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Crime of Genocide. Remember, these two things are important, prevention and punishment. The convention has been ratified by highest 149 states. Is the highest amongst all many of the UN, uh, you know, conventions because UN has several things, right? Conventions, treaties, and uh, uh, articles. So, uh, convention is something that states voluntarily agrees to sign on. So, this is one of the highest 149 countries uh, ratified. And International Court of Justice has repeatedly stated that convention embodies principles that are part of general customary international law. So genocide is a customary international law. That means it is applicable to all states, whether you have signed, uh, you are a part of 149 countries or not, it doesn't matter. And also um, states have ratified the genocide convention and it is bound as a matter of law by the principles that genocide is a crime prohibited under international law. And ICJ is the prime body um, which deals with the prohibition of genocide. And it says that uh, it's a norm in the international law uh, in Latin, uh, you know, <clears throat> the law folks, they use all Latin words. So jus cogens and no derogation is uh, allowed because this is the highest crime of humanity. So here you see um, these five basic definition of actions which will constitute genocide. A killing, and it is uh, mentioned in article two, remember, I'm going to ask you why article two? 
why the whole convention did not start with the definition, right? Typically what we do, for example, what I did today, I started with the definition that look folks, this is what, this is what. And now, now I'm going into the details, right? But it is super important and interesting to note that in 48 convention, the definition of genocide starts with article two, what constitutes genocide. And I'm going to show you what constitutes article one in article one. So article two, as you see, uh, it specifies uh, five uh, special uh, activities, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily harm and mental harm. Remember bodily or mental harm. And remember members of the group. And before even you go into that list, because these are pretty much clear, but do not forget this introduction. Genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in a part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. Intent to destroy is the key here. And the, the, the point is you have to really prove when the case is brought against you as a perpetrator in International Court of Justice, the lawyers have to prove that there is an intent. And it exactly happened in the case of Rohingya genocide when it was brought in, the, uh, in Hague in 2019, Aung San Suu Kyi was present and many of our colleagues from here went there also attended. And uh, we have seen that the main argument uh, was there about to prove Myanmar government's intent to destroy and which is really uh, has a very high threshold. So having said that now let's see what is article one. So this is the snapshot of the whole uh, what you call convention uh, in PDF. So you have the web link you can download now as I kind of uh, uh, alluded to in the previous slide, Article 1 starts in this convention about, <clears throat> and let me read it, contracting parties confirm that genocide, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime under international law, which they undertake to prevent and to punish. And this is why, do not ever use this term willy-nilly because it is super important because if you have acknowledged as a genocide something, you are bound obligated to take action according to article one, as you see. And this is why it has 18 or 19 articles in, in total, uh, the convention itself. And you'll find that it starts with article one that you have to punish and prevent. And then it starts saying, what is about genocide? So remember this important distinction in this convention. <clears throat> elements of crime, I, I also wanted to share with you that there are mental element, remember, and I, I, I touched upon in previous, one of the previous slides. <clears throat> there, there is always the methodology of the, of the crime. So the mental element is the intention to destroy. That is the methodological part. Because you see, there has to be a plan. The perpetrator, which has decided, perpetrator can be state or person, right? I mean, a number of persons, right? <clears throat> Political elites, social elites, religious elites, whatever. <clears throat> but they have decided, so they have come up with a plan. And this plan is their intention to destroy X, Y, Z, right? And then you have physical elements. And physical elements, as you see on the screen, killing and deportation, causing serious. So these are two different things which you must not ever forget because when you say genocide, it covers both these two things, the mental element and the physical element. Physical element is easy to prove. What happened in Ukrainian conflict now, uh, I'm, I'm also involved in uh, some of the projects that are run for, run for Canadian government. You can go to our website, you'll find a project idea, which we just finished. And uh, there we have tracked so many things with regards to disinformation campaign. But importantly, Ukraine war is the most recorded in the human history about the you know, transgression and the war crimes and all, most recorded because of the internet, because of the cell phone and etc. So in the uh, uh, Buka or Busa territory, when the uh, 
uh, bodies were found. So we quickly jumped and said that it is atrocity war crime. So it is important to uh, remember that in Ukraine war, these are all recorded very well uh, by the Ukrainians and international community. And I think if you are aware, very recently, ICC, International Criminal Court, has declared that uh, Putin will be tried as war criminal. So these are all, all documented, right? So I think it's the final slide to understand more clearly that uh, in general, what James Waller, one of my favorite professors in this area, and he's a distinguished uh, 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 scholar in uh, uh, Cohen, uh, he's working as a Cohen chair of Holocaust and Genocide Studies in King State College, Massachusetts. And uh, so he, uh, in his class, uh, because I was one of his uh, you know, summer students, um, so he mentions these things that atrocity crimes, if you uh, broadly, you know, uh, give an umbrella term of all these crimes, then you have these three distinct things. War crimes, crimes against humanity, and finally genocide. But these are not complementary, as I said right from the beginning. Don't use it interchangeably. War crimes, individual occurrences of crimes, such as rape, looting, pillaging, etc. Crimes against humanity, widespread and systematic and genocide specific intent to destroy racial and ethnic minorities. So this slide summarizes our definitional part and any ambiguities that we sometimes suffer from. <clears throat> now let me also introduce Genocide Watch, a Washington-based think tank with which we closely uh, sometimes you know, share our ideas and seek guidance and suggestions, especially the founder uh, Gregory Stanton, he came to our webinar so many times, uh, and we are deeply, uh, you know, grateful for his contribution. So, um, Genocide Watch actually came out with this fantastic ten-step uh, genocide process. It starts with classification. Uh, so, I'm not going to uh, get into all these details. I'm just touching the headlines so that you can. And it is very much self-explanatory. And once you have this slide, you will understand. So uh, out of the 10 steps, uh, these are the steps, classification. So, you know, the perpetrator classifies a group of people, uh, then uh, symbolization. Uh, so here comes the second step when the perpetrator starts, you know, hate um, speech, hate motivated, you know, things in radio, TV, and nowadays it is uh, internet, <clears throat> then starts discrimination, <clears throat> then goes into whole scale dehumanization, and then uh, the fifth stage is organization. Uh, so dehumanization happens in many forms. So in the case of Rwanda uh, genocide, what we see, the Hutu Tutsis, so there were a radio station which extensively was used uh, to demonize uh, you know, the others. And they were mentioned as cockroaches and all these things. So it is very consistent. And in the Rohingya case also, when we studied social media uh, from 2011 and onward, we saw the same thing, that dehumanization is a, is a planned activity done uh, in order to undermine the others. And then happens the stage five organization, uh, and it is about military, you know, paramilitary organizations, which will carry out these atrocities. Then happens stage six polarization, and stage seven preparation, and in the preparation, you might be confused that what kind of preparation has already happened, no? So, but what Genocide Watch is saying that in, in seventh stage, uh, you know, uh, this perpetrator comes up with, with noble ideas like nationalism. Uh, it is very common. Nationalism is super common uh, with regards to uh, genocide perpetrators. Uh, in the case of Nazis, uh, they came out with this euphemism, as, as they say, uh, the final solution, because Jews are you know, uh, not human, subhuman. In the case of Rohingyas, uh, man by military did the same thing, right? Uh, then uh, the stage eight persecution, it, again, it can happen in many forms. And uh, stage nine, uh, so one of the last stages is extermination, physical annihilation. And finally, most importantly, denial. And we have seen in many, many cases, we are still seeing that denial is one of the cornerstone of perpetrators because they will never accept that this has happened. And folks remember um, in, the, in the trials of Nuremberg and Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, there was not exactly the, the question of denial, 
but denial is a form of you know a reluctance to admit uh, you know if you remember the court the uh, essence of morality so i always keep thinking that well it is not denial because they are in the court and uh, we have evidence about their atrocities but again they are so normal as if nothing happened and we have seen same uh, things in the uh, uh, bosnian trial and rwanda trial as well <clears throat> Folks, just one slide and very quick discussion. All genocides are political. All. I mean, Armenian genocides, I mean, the, the just past century and a half ago, and so and so forth, all are political. Why? Because it is the political intention of perpetrators to annihilate others for various reasons. So when you talk about genocide, when you seek justice for the victims of genocide, you will be subjected to criticism. You will be subjected to resistance because the you know, uh, followers of perpetrators, the, you know, uh, the next generation of perpetrators remain. And in many cases, I don't want to generalize, in many cases you'll find that they will deny if anything has happened in the past with regards to the annihilation of this uh, particular group. So genocide is, is totally political and political intention of not only elites, but the state and nation is also involved. These are the two books. If you are interested, you can talk about uh, this thing. Um, cultural genocide, um, I just quickly uh, go over this idea that uh, in the initial work of Rafael Lemkin, he did mention about uh, the genocide culturally can be orchestrated too. Uh, there are growing debate whether we can really take the cultural component as a part of genocide. Because if you intend to destroy a particular ethnic group's culture, then whether you should be committing genocide, that is the moot question. And uh, if you ask me, I would definitely say yes, because destruction of one's culture is, is it definitely goes a very long way in order to uh, have this national identity. And here comes again another question of you know, identity politics. The last 10th stage, I'm still on uh, with this 10th stage. Uh, and, and in this slide, I will strongly recommend if you folks at your own time, uh, listen to two YouTube, uh, you know, uh, what do you call uh, YouTube, uh, 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 webinars that uh, we are we are put in the YouTube from our organization, <clears throat> and it is twenty. And each each year, we actually, we organize uh, an international seminar webinar uh, to remember Bangladesh genocide. So, twenty fifth March, the last one just happened, uh, and uh, twenty one September of twenty twenty two. Actually, uh, it's a mistake in this slide. So, if you listen to both these uh, YouTube uh, webinars. I just listen to the keynote speeches of these things. And uh, particularly on 25th March uh, uh, in 2023, Gregory Stanton from Washington Institute was our uh, 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 keynote speaker. And he had a wonderful presentation and lecture. So here you'll find how he describes denial. And in, on 21st September, I would strongly request you to listen to Professor Adam Muller uh, who has visited your institute too. So listen to his <clears throat> speech about genocide and how it and why it is important. <clears throat> Moving on. And uh, if you folks are uh, interested, do talk to me. And uh, each year, King State uh, in uh, King State College organizes uh, Genocide Prevention uh, Summer Institute. And I was uh, one of the uh, fortunate ones uh, who attended last year uh, in 2022, yeah. And uh, it's a wonderful gathering of experts uh, globally. And uh, seven days, you can stay in Boston, uh, close to Boston actually, uh, it's another part, uh, just 100 kilometers away. But I say I say leading institute in the world, which they are, you know talks about and researches about genocide prevention. And this year, uh, I've recommended one of the students from a Bangladeshi student. Uh, she just uh, she finished her master's in political studies, uh, and she has been nominated 
to attend the Summer Institute. And also I'm going to speak uh, uh, in the, uh, I'm a member of International Association of Genocide Scholars, IAGS. And in uh, July, in the 16th biennial meeting of, uh, of the Association of Genocide Scholars, I'm going to speak uh, in the law faculty of Barcelona University uh, about uh, Rohingya genocide and its prevention. So if you're interested, tune, uh, tune and we can share our thoughts. And uh, also we can talk about how to attend all these activities that happens with regards to genocide. Folks, prevention and accountability, these two important aspects that I would like to talk about now. So in the prevention part, which is of course in the pre-atrocity period, right? And before the direct annihilation or extermination, which I often call last act, happens. And in the prevention part, which, which we'll go more details now, and you can talk about all these things, but the important part is who's listening? Is, is there anybody listening? We know Coffee, Coffee Annan Commission in Rakhine State, uh, right after NLD's, uh, you know, uh, NLD came into power, and they did mention that genocide is coming, but nobody listened. And that is the problem with regards to genocide, that you can do everything, but somebody has to listen. And in terms of accountability, which we'll also talk a little bit, we have only two institutions internationally, International Criminal Court, which deals with individuals or individual crimes, and International Court of Justice, which deals with nation states, two different courts, two different actions. And importantly, in the accountability part, does recognition and remembrance matter? Which again, I'll talk a little bit about Bangladesh. So recognition and how do you remember uh, the atrocities is, is super important for the generations who has possibly not seen the you know, uh, atrocities, but have lived through the stories of the atrocities from their parents, grandparents. And this is important, how the genocide, atrocities, crimes have transmitted through generations, how the trauma has succeeded over generations. And, and this is why in the studies of genocide, we also strongly focus the remembrance part of the genocide. Here is James Waller, one of my favorite professors in this area. He's introduced prevention continuum, upstream, midstream, and downstream. Upstream, as you understand, before the crisis breaks out, midstream, when the crisis has already occurred and is going on, how to stop further life, and after the crisis, how do you rebuild the society? So in terms of upstream prevention, he talks about governance, economic conditions, track the conflict history and social fragmentation, and which you will find very common in all the genocides that happened in the past century. Because if you think about social fragmentation, for example, out of these four factors, you will find it definitely happened in Bosnia when after the you know, uh, dissolution of uh, Yugoslavia, and when the three states uh, came out, Croatia, Serbia, and Bosnia, Herzegovina, definitely there were social fragmentation and polarization. Definitely there was a risk. And this is why he always mentions about risk and prevention, risk and prevention. So these all constitutes about uh, upstream prevention. In the midstream prevention, uh, he mentions about the efforts and strategies aimed at intervening during the middle stage of, of, of a genocide. And in order to prevent further you know, uh, escalation and reducing harm. And he lists a number of things like early warning, diplomatic and political pressures. And you must uh, uh, recall what Samantha Power in her, uh, uh, in her opening lecture was trying to tell that uh, in the macro level, national level, international level, there must be diplomatic intervention. Then you have humanitarian assistance, peace building and uh, uh, trying international uh, criminal justice and civil society. Um, so finally, the downstream, when it has already happened, people were exterminated, killed, and all these things, 
but it aims at addressing the aftermath of genocide, including promoting justice, accountability, and reconciliation. And here he mentions about seven or eight activities, as you see in the screen, but most importantly, remember folks, rebuilding and reconciliation. This is important because perpetrators and the victims both remain in the same territory. Both have to live their lives together. You cannot separate and isolate the perpetrators from victim because this is how it happened, right? <clears throat> These five case studies, I would request uh, Professor Mamtaz to kindly uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, request you to you know, think more uh, because Rwandan genocide, Bosnia, Darfur, Yazidi, and Rohingya, these five are actually happened within a span of two to three decades. And these are all treated as genocide. So today we are not going to discuss about individual ones, but very briefly, Darfur uh, has been categorized as, uh, as one of the uh, genocides and US has already acknowledged and determined it as a genocide. And ICC uh, calls it the breach of international peace and security. And Omar al-Bashir, the Sudanese leader was indicted. Yazidi, uh, some of you might not be very well aware, uh, but in Canada, we are very much aware because we have taken a lot of Yazidi uh, refugees fleeing genocide. So in 2015, uh, UN declared that ISIS campaign against Yazidis is genocide. And ICC has also opened an inv investigation against war crime. But as you know, ISIS is, you know, is difficult to try. As I said, ICJ is the only platform to deal with the perpetrators, but let me warn you, ICJ is a court. And if you have some idea living in Bangladesh, how the court process works, then I think you will agree with me that it is a long, long walk. However, however, ICJ is our hope, is an institution where we can go and cry for justice. This is what is important. And it has made several important legal rulings related to genocide and the definition of genocide in the past. So now let's talk about very briefly again, Rohingya genocide. So it's not a case study we are doing. So I'm just giving you some of the ideas that in ICJ, what happened with regards to uh, Rohingya genocide is that recently, just last year, July, ICJ unequivocally said, application of the convention of the genocide Gambia versus Myanmar, the court finds that it has jurisdiction, which Myanmar actually opposed that you do not, Gambia does not have the jurisdiction. On the basis of article nine of the convention to entertain the application filled by the public of Gambia and the application is admissible. That means it is a genocide. That means it's an exceptional case that Gambia, not Bangladesh, or India or Pakistan or Qatar or Saudi Arabia where Rohingyas are living now uh, since they are displaced. It is Gambia, which is far away from Bangladesh, is, is you know, successful in admitting the case. Why? Now comes to the question. This is why. Territorial scope of the application of genocide convention. In genocide, because of its, uh, its nature of the crime, it, I can file a case right from my city in Winnipeg against Myanmar General. I can. It is admissible because genocide does not recognize any national boundary. It is an exceptional crime under international law. And uh, this is one you can read uh, because it is from European Union court. And uh, as you see here, that it's a positive obligation to prevent. This is why. And second thing is obligation not to commit genocide through their own organs or agents. So these are the two uh, you know, important aspects that you should remember that genocide case can be filed from anywhere. A bit of self-promotion maybe, I apologize for that, uh, but <laughs> I, I think it's important to tell you that uh, I lead two organizations, Conflict and Resilience Research Institute and Bangabandhu Center for Bang Bangladesh Studies in Canada. So particularly from Bangabandhu Center, uh, each year we organize uh, seminars, all are international uh, level. And very recently uh, we have held one on uh, 21 September uh, last year in Museum for Human Rights. And we partner with Liberation War Museum and Center for Genocide Studies. 
And uh, the last one, which just happened uh, last month, uh, we had another long I mean, as in, uh, important uh, event and you will find the speakers. So please visit our website. You will find the uh, videos uh, live recorded. So <clears throat> what we are trying to do here about Bangladesh genocide is two things. First, we are asking Western governments to recognize the Bangladesh genocide. In this regard, from this center, we have submitted an exhibit request to Museum for Human Rights. For the first time, Bangladesh ex exhibit of genocide has never been admitted to any museum in the world. So this is the first time we have submitted successfully and our application is under review. And that is why you, you might uh, know that Dr. Adam Muller and Jeremy Meron, Dr. Jeremy Meron from the uh, museum have traveled to Bangladesh in uh, January and February. So it is under active consideration. What we are trying to tell others that our genocide has happened with regards to Bangladesh and Bangladeshi people, which started in 1952. See the cultural component I was talking about. So it is my personal conviction that Bangladesh genocide should be and would be recognized internationally, which has not been done so far for your information. And we are, doing as, <clears throat> as best as we can to, uh, and this is our hashtag, remember and recognize. And we, we are asking uh, not only Canadian government, but uh, and others, and this is the first time so that you know, Genocide Watch, uh, the Washington-based think tank has actually circulated uh, uh, what you call uh, an, uh, an agenda, uh, a voting agenda to all the members uh, to support the case of Bangladesh genocide. So we are dedicated, we are motivated uh, to push this case uh, as long as it takes so that Western countries and others uh, do remember and recognize Bangladesh genocide. Finally, uh, I think this is my last slide, I believe. Yeah, um, <clears throat> folks, over the past one hour, uh, I tried to give you a very, I would say, general view of this uh, very problematic nature of human being. As I said in my opening remarks, in animal kingdom, they do not commit genocide against their fellow animals. It is us, we, we, we are the, you know, we have the capacity of evil. So this is why in this slide, if you see, you know, clockwise, Bosnian uh, Karajis, then uh, Sudan is Omar Bashir, ISIS leader, and a Cambodia, uh, you know, uh, the Cambodian genocide. Uh, uh, then you have a Rwandan genocide, and finally, yet to be tried, or let's say under trial, Mr. General uh, Ming Ong Lang in Rohingya case. The message in this slide is, folks, this. The perpetrators might think that they can get away with this crime. But if you see these folks, it took 50, 60 years, doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, they were held responsible for the crimes against humanity and genocide. They were held. And this is what I titled, Arc of Justice might be long, but it's certain it's going to happen. And in the case of Ukraine, we are also watching very closely whether same thing will happen to Mr. Putin. We don't know, but we are waiting to uh, waiting and see. So uh, with this, I will conclude uh, by saying that uh, you are young. You have definite advantage than I and others have in our life. You are young because you can think you are young because you can devote your time to do something extraordinary in your life. You are young because you can make it happen. We are old, we are past generations. We have knowledge, fine, but we don't have energy to implement. You can. Today's class, as I said right in the beginning, is very close to my heart, the topic is, because I really request you to do something with regards to Bangladesh genocide, because you are Bangladeshi, I was born Bangladeshi. So 
the point is what efforts that we are trying to do, please join your hands, support us, because Bangladesh genocide is forgotten. People don't want to talk about it. And when we raise this point uh, or raise this issue here, we were subjected to resistance from other groups. I'm not mentioning the name of the other group here, but we, we are subjected to a lot of resistance. One, this group say that why to raise this point after 50, 60 years, they are referring to 71 only. But as I said, I go back to 1952, right? So they're saying, number one, why to raise this point? Because it's going to destroy intergroup you know, relationship, especially those who live in Canada, right? Canada is a multicultural society. Second thing is, really, is it a, was it a genocide? Really? See, these two questions, denial. So this is why it is important that folks through this platform, I'm requesting you, send me an email in whatever way you can contribute help us because we need you. We need a lot of volunteers, right? And it's a volunteer organization. Bangabandhu Center is totally 100% volunteer organization. So we are working towards remembering and recogn uh, recognition of Bangladesh genocide uh, internationally. And in order to overcome those resistance, we really need you. And you are our hope for the future, as we always say. And uh, then I'll stop here and hand over to Professor Mamtaj. Thank you very much, Professor Montaz. Uh, I am done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir, for this uh, very informative discussion. Because war crime and genocide is a topic uh, very confusing to the common people. As I have took one time the course just once, I could I got the opportunity to take the course, and in next semester, inshallah, I will be taking the course again, if everything goes according to plan. So uh, what I found that the war crime and genocide, the things, the legal aspects are so confusing to the normal students, especially the aspect of war crime, because there is no single document which is codifying all the things. Uh, though uh, we are fortunate that already genocide, the legal aspect of genocide has gotten a form by, the, by this time, but war crime is still very fragmented. And I really struggle to make my student understand what's actually constituting war crime and what's actually not so so thank you for differentiating the three aspects war crime crime against humanity and genocide and the psychological aspect as you started your presentation like how normal the peoples are how they are they're not feeling a guilt guilty uh, they are just telling they are doing this for their nation so uh, thank you, sir, for focusing all the aspects of genocide very briefly, but very beautifully, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now I will invite our students. <clears throat> if you have any question, please uh, raise your hand and ask, sir, because sir is very a resource person regarding this field. So I hope, sir, will entertain your questions very beautifully. Fahad, Fahad, I can see your hand. Please ask Hello, your sir. question. Professor Mamtaz, before uh, Mr. Yeah. Bhatt takes over. So, because it is all about us, right? So, feel free to ask uh, in Bengali and in English, whatever you are comfortable with. Go ahead, Mr. Fahad. Thank you, sir, for this amazing session. I'm Fahad Al Salam, pursuing my master's in BOP. So, sir, uh, my question is we're living in this modern era, and, and there are many uh, options available to us. So, even in this modern era, why are we unable to develop such a framework that will bind those states who are parties or non-party members? Uh, why can't we bind the, those states to uh, obey these norms that we are building? Like, for example, when you are filing case against Putin, he's saying that I am not part of the ICC. And all, ag again, we can see that uh, many attacks like the attack on Masjid al-Aqsa goes unnoticed. So, I know it's a bit controversial one, but I would like to hear your opinion on this. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Fahad. <laughs> Wonderful question indeed. So in the field of human rights violation, let's say uh, in a very generic umbrella term, uh, we use human rights violation. I will really disappoint you and others that we don't have any instrument of enforcement in the world. Think about Myanmar. 
I'm going to go to Israel-Palestine issue. Definitely, I'm going to talk about it. But think about Myanmar. So what do you have in the United Nations? United Nations is formed with the principle of sovereignty of the states. You cannot violate sovereignty. Otherwise, I'm not going to be a member of UN. That's all. The, all the articles of UN uh, Assembly that if you, if you find, you'll find that UN was formed on this basis that nobody will interfere others' internal matters. So what happens, Mr. Putin says, it's my decision to do something. Uh, you know, somebody says that, okay, it is my decision to deal with my people. It's nothing about you. Why are you interfering in my domestic matters? That is one part, problem. And second part is, you do not have any international mechanism other than these two, right, ICJ and ICC, to hold someone accountable. You see, and again, I, as I said, it is downstream prevention. It has already happened, now you are bringing them in the court and trying. But in the midstream or upstream prevention, you actually do not have any framework. You do not have a world police that can be dispatched to Rakhine state and confront uh, Tatmado or the you know, Myanmar military uh, uh, against you know, Rohingya persecution. You don't. And remember, going back to the first clause, you cannot say anything with regards to a state which has taken a new unilateral decision to persecute its own group of people. So as I said, I'll frustrate you. And like you, we all are frustrated. But remember, the silver lining here is awareness. Now, Mr. Fahad, remember, 40 years ago, you did not have WhatsApp. You did not have Signal. You did not have Facebook, Twitter, you name it, Instagram. Now you have. And now you can document. Now you can record what has happened to you and others. And which, as I say, in the court will be admitted as exhibits and evidence. So this is the civil lining. But just to summarize, we do not have any enforceable mechanism for the violators or perpetrators committing crimes against humanity or genocide. Tadri? Thank you so much for your opinion, sir. No problem. Thank you. Oh, somebody was talking? OK. Uh, next, any question from the audience? Please raise your hands. Folks, question, question. Shoot me questions. Typically, when I teach uh, uh, courses here, um, we don't uh, teach like this because our courses are, uh, and of course, some of you will come here eventually. Uh, you'll find this. It's, I mean, we don't give a lecture per se. I mean, we just discuss, right? I mean, uh, I act as a facilitator, all these things. So in here, when you come, you'll find a lot of group discussions and uh, because we strongly emphasize on critical thinking. Um, this is our uh, fundamental principle of, uh, you know, pedagogy here. So shoot me questions because questions are important. I guess they have less nice question because they haven't started the course yet. It will be I in see. the next semester. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, I see. Yeah, I see. Oh, okay. in the next semester. Oh. That's the main problem. I oh, guess. I see. I see. I see. No problem. No problem. So, uh, folks, if you do not have any question, then uh, uh, let me conclude by saying that, uh, and I'll hand over to Professor Mumtaz again for her, uh, you know, uh, round up the session. But um, as I finish, uh, I am I'm really inviting you. Uh, to uh, the activities that we are doing from Bangabandhu Center and uh, Conflict and Resilience, uh, because it's not about the case of Bangladesh and Rohingya, but about everyone. You see, the case of Israel and Palestine, uh, which often are, uh, have very different ways of explaining and uh, interpreting, especially in the West, I'm not talking about Bangladesh, but I'm talking uh, in the West, uh, this conflict is viewed in a very you know, different ways. So the essential part is talking about it. So for example, this forum, you know, we have reached to 40, 30 of you, including your professors and others. So it is important. And especially for the case of, as people told me that, why are you raising this issue now in Canada about Bangladesh genocide? For them, 
this is the major challenge because nobody wants to remember that a huge atrocity has been done to Bangladesh. And it is, it is not about the 71 war. It was a war, the final act. It started in 1952 when the methodical intention to destroy the culture, the identity of Bangladeshi people were, were, were at stake. And this is how it starts. It's a process. And this process begins and it ends. And that's what we see in 71 as an independent nation state, Bangladesh. And this is what we try and you and through me, and I'm trying to say the same thing uh, once again, that uh, please do join in discussions, write and do volunteer works uh, with us or anyone you feel like Liberation War Museum in, right in Bangladesh. Um, they are our partner actually. Uh, and we always do a lot of things with them. So keep this discussion alive so that it doesn't happen. And remember, Bangladesh is one of the unique countries in the world, which is a victim and which is a supporter of Rohingyas, those who are victim themselves. It is the unique case in the world. It never happened anywhere. And this is what is our main focus here in Canada and especially North America to let people know that Bangladesh is, is really a unique case here. And we must not forget because that will be an injustice to the people, those who lost their lives over these 30, 40 years since 52. It will be an injustice to 30 million people, right? So this is why the discussion must remain alive on genocide. Otherwise it will again happen with somebody else somewhere. Thank you very much, Professor Muntaz. Thank you, Sachin. Uh, I have- uh, <coughs> Thank you, excuse me, uh, Mr. Kalsar. Uh, professor, I, I would like to thank Dr. Professor Kausar on behalf of BUP uh, for such wonderful and uh, nicely delivered uh, lecture session. Uh, I myself have uh, got a lot of knowledge on it. I, I didn't know so much about genocide. But I had been through these uh, classes also, and I have been benefited through your lecture. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your... <laughs> I'm very I'm sure that the students of BUP have been highly benefited out of it. And thank you also, uh, Assistant Professor Mumtaj, for conducting the supporting the session. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I think, uh, uh, sir, with your permission, let's take two questions. Mumtaj has one, and I think B underscore 24, I don't know what, what's her name is. Uh, she has raised her uh, hand. So should I, should we take B to, yeah, go ahead, ma'am, yes, please. Yes. Uh, I want to ask later, uh, but uh, let, let's uh, open the floor for the student who, is raised, who has raised the hand. Anyone, can, you can speak, please. framework <laughs> International police implement the Myanmar. In the Amra Jotu Chan is a R2P framework already which the German Hume Hulu, Rwanda Teba, Arabish Kichu, state nation, a genocide by crime against humanity, Jotun Hose, Tokon Hulu, R2P implement for a Hose, Tahule, Myanmar, Kepra Kamweta for us. Excellent question. Excellent question. And I did intentionally avoid R2P because it itself is a subject. And I wish if BUP wants me to deliver another lecture, I'll be more than happy to talk about R2P. And R2P is also very interesting because it is Canadian concept, just so that you know. it The concept has been developed in Canada. We have an institute nationally. And Canada actually was the uh, country which uh, submitted the framework in UN General Assembly and then adopted. Uh, what is your name, ma'am, by any chance? Sadia. Sadia. So, Sadia, uh, you are very correct that we did see uh, first, uh, you know, what, let's say, intervention in Bosnia, actually. So, in Bosnian war, uh, if you see, uh, UN has intervened with a mission itself. It's called UNPROFOR. But before that, uh, the coalition of willings, that what we call. So at that time, R2P was not there as a, as a protocol, but uh, 
with the US-led activities, especially people like Samantha Power, those are very active. So they were crying uh, uh, quite a bit. And I think uh, we have seen this intervention directly, especially the uh, air attack uh, on the Serbian uh, you know, forces. So that really helped and stopped the further killings and other things. So that is there. But the problem is uh, Sadia and uh, for the rest of others, how do you really get this coalition of willing going? You see, America, we know America what it is, right? We all agree. <laughs> they have the most resources. And if they will to do something, then they can. They can bring Canada because America and Canada is kind of very close in terms of their geopolitical uh, you know, and foreign policies. So they can build a group quickly. And what, as I again said, it's a coalition of willing. So they went and intervened in Bosnia in, in a military, right? Intervention military. In the case of uh, uh, Rwanda, again, uh, as I said, I didn't touch because I didn't want to open another one hour discussion here. In Rwanda, Canada is deeply involved. If you Google search General Romeo de Lair, you will find that Canada, he was the first commander in Rwanda under which watch, uh, whose watch uh, there were a lot of you know killings and all we know. So he came and he was a general, Canadian general, and retired and he wrote uh, you know fantastic books. Uh, and one is right in my shelf, uh, it's called uh, Shaking Hands with Devil. And he also founded an organization of the, for the child soldiers. So in that case also, what we see that the coalition of the willing didn't work. Rather, UN was trying to delay the intervention, trying to think, okay, what to do, what not to do, and the you know uh, this whole case happened. So intervention-wise, you are very right. We have something with regards to responsibility to protect, and as I said, we have that. But the problem is how to get people, you know, sign up for this protocol and action. In the case of Myanmar, again, as I said, it's political. China, Chinese influence. Remember who all are the stakeholders in Myanmar, economically and politically, these two cases. In our book, uh, which was published in 2019, I would request you to have a look. In a chapter, Geopolitics, I wrote extensively that why responsibility to protect cannot work, will not work, because of the active involvement of China, Japan, India, and Singapore, these four, you know, I call uh, big fours, they are directly involved with trillions of dollars of investment in Myanmar. So any kind of military intervention conflict, no, no. And also do not forget, which is in the agenda in the international forum, Ukraine or Myanmar? Of course, Ukraine. Because you know it has all these things. Many of many Canadians have Ukrainian descent, but Myanmar is a distant place. Myanmar is far off the radar. Who cares about Myanmar? Nobody. Myanmar is not a state actor. Myanmar is not in the world forums, economic forums. Yeah, maybe an ASEAN member, but nobody is interested about Myanmar. Unfortunately, that is the geopolitics and the reality of the geopolitics. Okay, Sadia. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Montas, yeah, go ahead. So I have a, uh, I have uh, a question regarding 1947 atrocity. So that's another case where uh, millions of people have died and, and 15 million, if I'm not wrong, people were uprooted from their home. So what's your thought about it, sir? Because there was no fixed property to, like we can accuse me and government for uh, the, what is happening for, uh, about with Rohingyas or like, what is your thought about 1947, sir. Partition. I mean, you're sir, partition. To partition. Okay. Sir, sir, partition. Absolutely. 1947. Yeah. So, uh, 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 British Indian partition. So, you are you are absolutely right that if you if we go through the definition of genocide, forcible deportation, right? Forcible deportation of a group of people, and especially uh, ethno ethnic and religious group, and that that is really is the is the cardinal point of genocide right and i think it qualifies as a genocide but the essential problem montas is who are you going to accuse of is it the uh, british colonizers who were leaving india hurriedly after the second world war as they promised 
or the Jawaharlal Nehru, the founding, uh, you know, uh, 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 president of uh, founding New father India, of founding father of New India, or Mr. Yeah. Jinnah, Jinnah. Who are you going to accuse? And and this is why possibly people do not want to talk about forty-seven. Uh, but you are very right in the definition of uh, genocide, forcible deportation, uh, definitely falls in this category, and I think it qualifies uh, to be tried as genocide. But as I said always. Uh, uh, that it is really a very high threshold to to uh, prove that there was an intent to destroy. Uh, and yeah. particularly in this 47 uh, issue, I would say that we don't have, uh, you know, uh, uh, the actor. For example, in many of the cases, we have some identifiable actors, like uh, Nazis in the Second World War, they committed Holocaust. Then you have uh, Omar Bashir and his regime in Sudan. Then you have uh, Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Then you have uh, you know, Serbia in, in terms of Bosnia. So uh, we have those identifiable group and against which you could file. But 47 cases is really problematic because it was post-war, you know, uh, you know, reorganization of war order. And of course, how do you try, uh, you know, British government? I mean, in terms of perpetrating violence. Thank you. And I think you have sir, uh, rightly said that their the intent issue was it was very confusing because there was not actually a, a concert intent to destroy the community. Right, right. Uh, but you're very right. unfortunate that uh, so many people have sir, lost their lives. Hundred uh, percent. Agreed. 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 And and definitely, it is one of the defining moment in the post second world war history. Uh, and and we don't know much about it because you see there are hardly any scholarships, that, right? Nobody, sir, no, nobody yeah. recall it now, sir. Yeah. But yeah. but uh, as I have took another course, South Asian Affairs, that time I was reading about the things in very detail and it was very shocking for me for the first time. Oh, yeah, when yeah. I saw um, how much activity <laughs> that time it, it happened. So no, absolutely. You, absolutely. And uh, thank you so much once again. And don't want to uh, you know, uh, hold you uh, in, in, in Ramzan. So stay well, folks, and stay connected. Uh, I've given you all these uh, email information, et cetera. Uh, please be in touch. Montas, thank you very much. Uh, Major Faisal, sir, thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.